Bogdan Bukur. I'm doing both. Maybe I should use two microphones, one to introduce myself and the other one to say thank you for introducing me. Um, I teach at, <laughs> at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. Uh, and this is one of the texts that I think um, fascinated me and fascinated many others, of course, and is worth engaging with. Discerning the radiant face of Christ in the visions of the patriarchs and prophets of old, or the visions of those apostles and eyewitnesses of his in the new dispensation, was for early Christians not a matter of quote-unquote biblical exegesis alone, but a complex whole involving exegetical, visionary, pedagogical, aesthetical, and liturgical dimensions. Among the earliest Christian texts in which these dimensions are visible, um, perhaps the most arresting one is the story of the two disciples journeying to, the, to Emmaus, away from Jerusalem, found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. The bibliography is huge here, but the text remains difficult to crack. Why do the disciples not recognize Christ, although they have extensive conversations with him? Why do, them, why do they recognize him afterwards, suddenly, and the breaking of the bread? And once they have recognized him, why is it that he vanishes immediately? Perhaps the very expectation of cracking the text exegetically is misplaced, because after all, the Emmaus text insists that real comprehension requires that one's eyes and, minds be, and mind be opened. And even then, the result apparently is only a fleeting and incomplete sight which is transformational precisely because it exceeds and overwhelms perception. So let us note first that in this text, getting it, as it were, is coextensive with and inseparable from recuperating a relationship of discipleship through a therapeutic refashioning of the self and rejoining the community of disciples. Since, according to Jesus himself, it is the dull nous and the hardened heart that prevent the two from recognizing the very Jesus walking with them, he undertakes to cure his disciples precisely by opening their noose and melting their hearts. The two disciples are moving from arrogance to humility, from sadness and despair to abundant joy, from blindness to vision, from hosting a stranger and berating him for not understanding anything, to becoming guests at the Messiah's own Eucharistic table. Their former understanding of ta teri isu vanishes and gives way to the Messiah's own proclamation of ta teri aftu, which shapes their new identity as witnesses of the risen Christ and therefore members of the community that they go and rejoin. Overall, it's a story of conversion, really. It's a gradual process of conversion, which ultimately reverses the journey away from Jerusalem, leading the two back to Jerusalem, and reintegrating them into the community of disciples. This radical change of perspective and direction bears witness in typical Lutheran fashion to the efficacy of Christ's work as pedagogue and healer of infirmities. The evangelist implies, I think, a link between the disciples' inability to perceive, to recognize Christ, and the glorified state of Christ. It is clear from the juxtaposition of verse 26 was it not necessary that the Messiah should, that Christ should suffer and enter into his glory? And verse 46, it is written that the Messiah should suffer and rise from the dead, that Luke identifies Jesus' resurrection with his entrance into glory. Since the Messiah then, on the road to Emmaus, has completed this predicted journey through suffering and death into glory, a fundamental incompatibility obtains between his state and the state of his interlocutors. Just as at the transfiguration the master is in glory and the disciples not yet, in the risen Christ the age to come is already here and here and now, while the disciples, to them this has not yet happened. Might this incompatibility account for the misidentification of the risen Lord reported in the Simeon story? Perhaps, but we are still faced with a considerable difficulty, namely, if the Messiah has through his resurrection come to be in glory, it is nevertheless true that the risen Christ lacks the dazzling, overwhelming effulgence of the transfigured Christ. Briefly stated, the problem is that the glory of the risen Messiah is not luminous. I have argued elsewhere that Luke's account about the light of the divine glory being present and active but invisible to the beholder finds parallel among his contemporaries. 
in the Liber Antiquitatum Biblicarum, a work very likely originating in the Holy Land sometime in the late first or early second century, the famous episode of Moses coming down from Sinai, his face all glorified to the point of striking fear into the, uh, uh, the others, the Aaron and the elders, is retold in a following manner. Moses came down, having been bathed with light that could not be gazed upon, he had gone down to the place where the light of the sun and the moon are. The light of his face surpassed the splendor of the sun and the moon, but he was unaware of this. When he came down to the children of Israel, upon seeing him, they did not recognize him, or they did not know him. But when he had spoken, then they knew him. So let us note the significant difference between the biblical text and this retelling. In the biblical account, the glory of Mo on Moses' face is perceived as fearsome and blinding, so intense that the Israelites could not gaze on Moses' face and were afraid. But there is no doubt they recognize who it is, that it is Moses. By contrast, in the Liber, the light of glory is not perceived as light by anyone. It is invisible, he says, but instead effects a complete lack of recognition. It seems that Moses' glorification on Sinai has made him similar to God, while also introducing a certain incompatibility between him and the people. He is charged with glory, while they are not. He is bathed in invisible light, they are not. And the same happens to David after he slays Goliath. They did not recognize him because he was so radiant in a way they could not see, but they could not understand who this was. I have no idea what invisible light could mean here, writes Roman Jacobson, the most recent editor, translator, and commentator of the Liber. We will soon interrogate the early Christian tradition on this point. For now, however, I submit that Luke and his contemporaries assume that when one is wrapped or drenched in divine light, one becomes unrecognizable to the people who are not open to the same presence of God. Luke would add that in such circumstances, one's eyes are actually held from a vision that might be unbearable. The depiction of the risen Christ in Luke 24 not only evokes comparable depictions of Moses, but should also be read as, a, as an allusion to Eden. Some structural and even verbal correspondence can be noted. Their eyes were opened and they came to know in Luke, but also in Genesis. The taking and sharing of food occurs in Luke and Genesis and effects um, this, this um, opening of the eyes. It is most, more difficult, at least at first sight, to find a correspondence between the initial state of the disciples and the initial state of the forefathers. <clears throat> but the problem disappears if one assumes with Luke and his contemporaries that, um, as well as with the bulk of Christian tradition, that when the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened, they recognized not that they had been naked all along, but that they had just become naked, naked of the garment of light. Considered in this light, pun intended, the Emmaus episode seems to construct an antithetical parallel between Genesis and Emmaus, aiming in typical Christian and Lucan fashion at establishing the resurrection of Jesus as the undoing of, of what went wrong in Eden. If Adam and Eve are initially, initially endowed with the garment of glory and find themselves in paradise, Cleopas and his unnamed companion are initially outside the reality of the risen Christ, who is in his glory, um, <clears throat> and gradually are adopted into it. Unlike Adam and Eve, who tasted the fruit of knowledge in the wrong way, at the wrong time, from the wrong provider, the disciples receive it from the very hand of the Lord. Their eyes are opened, not to recognize the loss of glory, but to recognize the glorified Christ. The disciples are, in other words, made again compatible with God, albeit not yet completely. The vision cannot be sustained for more than an instant, and the risen Jesus, although present, becomes invisible, but no less present to them. What I have sketched so far is, I believe, consonant with the theological exegesis of the fathers. St. Ephraim of Nisibis, in his Hymns on Paradise, which echo all the Jewish and Christian traditions, draws a parallel between the structure of paradise and the structure of the Jerusalem temple, such that the Holy of Holies corresponds to the Tree of Life, and the temple curtain in front of the Holy of Holies corresponds to the tree of knowledge. Within this theological framework, 
Ephraim sees a correspondence between the fruit of the tree of knowledge and the bread that the risen Christ shares with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And I'm quoting St. Ephraim. When the accursed one, Adam, learned how the glory of that inner tabernacle, as if in a sanctuary, was hidden from them, and that the tree of knowledge served as a veil for the sanctuary, he realized that its fruit was the key of justice that would open the eyes of the bold and cause them great remorse. Their eyes were opened, though at the same time they were closed, so as not to see the glory of that inner tabernacle, nor to see the shame of their own bodies. When the disciples' eyes were held closed, or sorry, when the disciples' eyes were held closed, bread was the key whereby their eyes were opened to recognize the omniscient one. Saddened eyes beheld a vision of joy and were instantly filled with happiness. Positing the Eucharist as an inversion of the disordered and disobedient partaking of the fruit before the appointed time is a Christian twist given to a larger discussion and an older discussion. For the sectarians at Qumran also and for the apocalyptic group behind the so-called Enoch literature as well as for Jesus followers, of course, the abiding interest is that of recovering all the glory of Adam. This brings us to another strand in, early, in the early Christian reception of the Emmaus episode, which places Luke 24 among a constellation of other biblical texts bearing witness to the experience of, luminous and divine, of a luminous and divine presence as either purgative and transfigurative or punishing and destructive. Origin identified the burning hearts of the disciples on the road to Emmaus with the love, with the love wound in Canticle, the Song of Songs 2.5, I'm wounded with love, which he says is caused by Isaiah's chosen arrow. <clears throat> he has made me like a chosen arrow, says the Logos, which Jeremiah experienced as a burning fire in his bones. It became like a burning fire in my bones. This arrow causing the wound of the burning heart is the Logos, Christ himself, who came to cast fire upon the earth, according to the Gospel of Luke. This fire, Origen exclaims, refers to a certain form of fire, imperceptible, which unlike physical fire consuming the surface, burns inside, burns the heart, and comes in such a way that he cannot bear the burning. Just like earthly fire has a double action, burning and illumining, spiritual fire, Origen says, is also double in nature. It can be the light that enlightens every man. It can also be the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In the same footsteps of origin, St. Basil the Great uses pretty much the same passages and others as well. The fire in question is God's word in Jeremiah's heart, like a burning fire shot up in his bones. The fire from the Lord that consumed Aaron's sons, as well as the fire of the burning bush, and the live coal fed by the seraph to Isaiah. A similarly rich tapestry of biblical passages illustrating this fire is woven by the Pseudomacaron homilies, in a very influential passage. Our God is a consuming fire taking revenge upon those who do not know him in flaming fire and who do not obey his gospel. This fire exerted its power over the apostles when they spoke in tongues of fire. This fire surrounded Paul um, in the voice that enlightened his mind and blinded his senses of sight. It was not in the flesh that he saw the power of that light. This fire appeared to Moses in the bush. This fire caught up Elijah from the earth and David, while seeking out the power of this fire, said, Search me, Lord, and try me. Burn out my reins and my heart. This fire inflamed the heart of Cleopas and his companion when the Savior spoke to them after the resurrection. The text of this homily was reprised in its entirety among the collection of Greek writings ascribed to Ephraim of Nisibi, the Greek Ephraim, and came to be interpolated in the prologue of Basil of Caesarea's Asceticon, which further heightened its influence among monastics. It comes as no surprise to find St. Simeon, the new theologian, um, that he refers to the burning heart of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus as bearing witness to the real yet invisible and ineffable fire, ray, cloud of light, sun, by which Christ himself manifests himself to the practitioner, endowing him with a new capacity of sight that apprehends the heights of contemplation. And just as in Luke 24, this ecstatic and transformative experience is said to provide a trustworthy interpretation of all that was written in the scriptures, of all the scriptures. Some centuries after Simeon, the new theologian, the same text, that is the, the uh, Makaran homily, the same text of homily 25, 
is invoked as an important scriptural warrant for the experience claimed by the Hesychast practitioners of seeing and being transformed by the uncreated light of God. Um, sorry, 20, Luke 24 was used, of course. What is more, the above referenced passage in the Pseudomachian homily 25 is quoted, ascribed, it, ascribed to Basil. It is quoted by Gregory Palamas and some of his followers who evidently continue to identify the burning heart and the fire that causes it in Luke 24 uh, with all the theophanic phenomena that I've just quoted in Isaiah, Jeremiah, burning bush, and so forth. In conclusion then, some insight into the theological assumptions and intentions of the Emmaus story can be gained by reading Luke 24 in light of Second Temple traditions about the divine glory expressed as luminosity, luminosity of the protoplast, luminosity of Moses and other elect individuals. The data gleaned from a survey of the patristic reception of uh, Luke 24 are largely consonant with the reading of the Emmaus episode in light of the Lucan transfiguration account, Mark's longer ending, and the Liber Antiquitatum Biblicarum. Despite the absence of any explicit reference in the biblical text to the luminosity of the risen Jesus, early Christian exegetes had no problem understanding Luke 24 to imply that the risen Jesus was fiery and hyperluminous, and they saw in the various stages of the theophany lack of recognition, sudden recognition, final disappearance from sight, the marks of the pedagogical and mystagogical adaptation to the weakness of the recipient. A first strand of patristic interpretation establishes this antithetical parallel between the opening of the eyes at Emmaus and the opening of the eyes in Eden, and reads the entire episode as a reversal of Genesis 3 within the theological framework that connects Eden, Sinai, and the Eucharist. A second strand is mostly focused on the experience of the burning heart and the presumed luminosity of the risen Christ, connecting the story, the Emmaus story, with some of the most significant biblical theophanies of the Old Testament, Exodus 3, Isaiah 6, Acts 9, and with the interior experience of divine light claimed by Christian ascetics. By reading Luke 24 in, light, in line with biblical theophanies is a witness to the luminous, fiery, albeit supersensual manifestation of God's presence. Tradition also links exegesis, spiritual discipleship, liturgy, and the visionary experience. On this point, patristic reception history is consonant with and in fact develops suggestions already present in Luke's text. As clarified by its Second Temple context and its early Christian exegesis, the Lucan story illustrates the principle of a distinctly Christian entry into the scriptures of Israel and the paradigm to be reproduced again and again for situating exegesis in a pedagogical, liturgical, and transformational context. Let us note also that the opening of the scriptures of the eyes and of the noose in Luke 24 is not apologetic or polemical, but testimonial and mystagogical. Even if the readers of the Emmaus story receive immediate access to the identity of the traveler, we know who this was. It's no mystery to us, the readers. And the Christological key that opens all the scriptures. They are nevertheless not thereby initiated in the twinned experiences of the risen Christ and the burning heart. This testimony paints rather the endless horizon that Luke sets before his ideal readers. Thank you very much.